In this video, I will look at a published paper which is in support of lockdown. It is possibly the most famous and most influential scientific paper in support of lockdown, often cited by lockdown advocates and held up as evidence as to why lockdowns were necessary. It is a key paper and received wide media coverage, such as from the BBC, lockdowns in Europe saved millions of lives. From the Daily Mail, lockdowns may have prevented at least 3 million deaths in Europe and almost 500,000 in the UK. In the Daily Mirror, lockdowns saved 470,000 Brits and over 3 million lives across Europe. The study behind these mainstream newspaper reports was this. Estimating the effects of non-pharmaceutical interventions on COVID-19 in Europe. It was published on the 8th of June 2020 in the scientific journal Nature. It has 18 authors named, and so it's often referred to simply as the Flaxman paper. It looked at 11 European countries for the period from the start of the COVID-19 epidemics in February 2020 until the 4th of May 2020. The paper modelled two scenarios for these countries for within this time period. Their first model basically mirrored what happened in real life, producing death figures which were very close to the actual number of deaths. Then the second model was a hypothetical counterfactual scenario to estimate the deaths that would have occurred without interventions. It was a model which attempted to estimate the number of deaths that would have occurred if there were no lockdown interventions. I will refer to this model as the counterfactual model. What they did was they then compared the number of deaths predicted by this counterfactual model of no lockdown interventions to the model which resembled what happened in real life and concluded that millions of deaths were averted. They state, by comparing the deaths predicted under the model with no interventions, by that they mean the counterfactual model, to the deaths predicted in our intervention model, by that they mean the model which resembled what happened in real life. We calculated the total deaths averted in our study period, so just until the 4th of May 2020. We find that across 11 countries, 3.1 million deaths have been averted owing to interventions since the beginning of the epidemic. Now on the surface that sounds compelling, however I want to explore this a little more deeply. Firstly, their counterfactual model assumed that the whole population were immunologically naive to the virus and therefore that everyone was susceptible. Their counterfactual model accounted for no pre-existing immunity. However, there is a growing body of research showing that there is a significant amount of cross immunity in many people from previous exposure to other coronaviruses. Peer reviewed scientific papers have recently been published that show pre existing immunity by T cells and other mechanisms in people that have not been infected with SARS CoV 2. So, having a counterfactual model which assumed no pre existing immunity, so having the whole population susceptible, leads to a gross overestimation of the predicted deaths. Secondly, their counterfactual model assumed no voluntary change in behaviour if lockdown was not imposed. One of the assumptions built into the counterfactual model was that society would continue exactly as usual. However, this is unrealistic. It is absurd to claim that people would have just carried on as normal in response to a global pandemic. There will always be societal changes in behaviour when populations are faced with threat there would be a voluntary reduction in social contacts and voluntary social distancing. Their counterfactual model assumed that this would not happen to any degree. If the authors advocate that lockdown interventions reduce transmission rates, then by the same token, they would also believe that voluntary measures would have an impact in reducing transmission rates. Yet their counterfactual model does not account for it in any way. The third questionable assumption used in the study was that the rate of SARS-CoV-2 transmission would only decrease in response to lockdown interventions. The paper states, RT, which is the reproduction number, is modelled as a piecewise constant function that changes only when an intervention occurs. So their counterfactual model assumed that the degree of viral spread would continue indefinitely within the study time period with no decrease. But this is absurd. It is not based on what we know of respiratory viruses and was not seen like that in any country in the world. What did happen was that each country, irrespective of lockdown policy, had infections increase, reach a peak, followed by a subsequent decrease. It is the same path of any epidemic that has been studied for decades and decades, 
It is the characteristic bell-shaped curve of infections in epidemics, which was identified by William Farr back in 1814. Yet this law of science wasn't factored into the counterfactual model. Nor was seasonality and the effect it would have on the reproductive rate. The seasonal effect on transmission of respiratory infections is well established scientifically. As the season moves from spring to summer, this is not conducive to transmission of respiratory viruses and infection rate decreased dramatically, irrespective of whether a country mandates lockdowns or not. Yet the Flaxman study did not mention this important concept of seasonality even once in their paper. The fourth questionable assumption was the infection fatality rates that they built into the counterfactual model. They have been criticised as being excessively and unrealistically high and not consistent with real world data. Therefore, this resulted in the counterfactual model predicting death figures which were grossly exaggerated. Models are only as good as the assumptions put into them and I've identified four flawed assumptions that were built into the counterfactual model. This resulted in a significant overestimate of predicted deaths in the counterfactual model which was their hypothetical no lockdown scenario. They then used that overinflated prediction and compared it to the model constructed to reflect the real number of deaths that occurred. And they conclude falsely, look, lockdown saved all these lives. But it is circular reasoning. They show that lockdowns are effective by designing a model that has in its assumptions that lockdown interventions are effective. The conclusion, therefore, is merely a restatement of the assumptions of the model. This is their reasoning. Premise one, deaths would have continued without lockdown. Their next premise, there was a lockdown, then from these two premises they draw the conclusion, therefore it was lockdown that prevented the deaths. Indeed, the Flaxman authors seem to have some insight into this when they write, the counterfactual model without interventions is illustrative only and reflects our model assumptions. But to just acknowledge this is simply not good enough and incredibly weak science. They provide no evidence that their counterfactual model is a correct prediction of what would have happened. It is the result of the assumptions built into it, and as I have shown, many of these assumptions are questionable. The Flaxman paper was so heavily criticised by the scientific community that a few months later, Nature, the very same journal that published the original paper, published a Matters Arising paper. This was in December 2020 and was titled The Effect of Interventions on COVID-19. This paper pointed out some of the fundamental problems with the Flaxman paper and concludes, we find the underlying modelling approach problematic, masked by model assumptions. This has led the authors to go beyond the data in reporting that particular interventions are especially effective. This kind of error, mistaking assumptions for conclusions, is easy to make. We suggest that the model and its conclusion, that all non-pharmaceutical interventions apart from lockdown have been of low, low effectiveness, should be treated with caution with regard to policy making decisions. That's pretty damning from the very journal that published the original paper. The Flaxman models have been widely criticised, for example in this article published in Frontiers in Medicine Journal. It says, in case of a finite population, the effective reproduction number falls automatically and necessarily over time. The model of Flaxman contradicts this elementary insight. They estimate the reproductive number may only change at those dates where interventions became effective. Such an approach does not prove that non-pharmaceutical interventions were effective, but rather begs the result, i.e. involves circular logic. This is strong criticism of the Flaxman paper and their counterfactual model. In this paper, they go on to question why Sweden was included as an example of a country that locked down. They write, Our final remark regards Sweden, the only country in the data set that refrained from strong measures, but has a lower corona deaths per capita than Belgium, Italy, Spain or the United Kingdom. In the absence of a lockdown, but with an effective reproduction number that declined in the usual fashion, Flaxman attribute the sudden decline in Sweden's reproduction number almost entirely to banning of public events. This is a good point. Sweden was included as one of the countries where lockdowns averted deaths, but Sweden is famously known for not locking down. 
This is the Flaxman paper's extended table one, which shows their model outputs, total forecasted deaths since the beginning of the epidemic up until the 4th of May 2020 in our model and in a counterfactual model that assumes no interventions. The first column is observed deaths, which were the deaths that occurred in real life. The second column is the deaths that occurred in their model that resembled what happened in real life. So as you can see, the results of these columns are almost the same, as that's how they designed the model. Then this third column is their counterfactual model, that is, the deaths that they predict would have occurred if there were no lockdown. Sweden just here had 2,769 actual COVID-19 deaths by the 4th of May 2020, according to the paper's own data. That's what happened in real life. The counterfactual model for Sweden, which was the no lockdown scenario, predicted 28,000 deaths by the 4th of May 2020. But this doesn't make sense, as Sweden never did lockdown, yet didn't even see a tenth of those deaths by that date. The authors of the paper stipulated that Sweden's ban on public gatherings counted as a lockdown, but it is implausible to think that this lockdown measure prevented 26,000 COVID-19 deaths. In that three-month study period, Sweden had no stay-at-home orders and no business closures. Kindergartens and schools for children up to 16 years old stayed open. Bars, cafes and restaurants stayed open. There were no enforced quarantines for infected households. Sweden did not lock down. In fact, Sweden is an example of what happens without lockdown. The counterfactual model for Sweden predicted 28,000 COVID-19 deaths in the hypothetical no lockdown scenario from the start of the pandemic to the 4th of May 2020. But in real life, it had less than 2,800, and that was without a lockdown. This therefore shows how flawed the counterfactual modelling is in this study. A model is only as accurate as the assumptions built into it, and the assumptions built into the counterfactual model in this study led to a gross overestimation of predicted deaths that would occur without lockdown. So clearly this invalidates the counterfactual model in this study, and therefore all these lives averted figures are wrong. This study cannot conclude from this modelling that lockdown averted 470,000 deaths in the UK and 3.1 million deaths in Europe. These figures are the output of a flawed counterfactual model that had built into it numerous flawed assumptions. One final point about this Flaxman paper. It is important to mention the authors and potential conflicts of interest. There were 18 authors, including Neil Ferguson, and all but one of them were staff at the Imperial College London. This in itself should prompt questions. It was these guys, Neil Ferguson and his colleagues from the Imperial College, whose notorious model-based paper just three months prior projected up to 550,000 deaths occurring in the UK if lockdown was not implemented. This infamous paper, published on the 16th of March 2020, was pivotal in the decision to implement the UK lockdown. These guys were therefore deeply invested in the lockdown theory, which doesn't invalidate their paper, but it does raise serious questions of impartiality. In conclusion, this paper by Flaxman et al. is one of the key published papers that advocates for lockdown, and it is held up as evidence for the necessity of lockdown. Even though it's littered with false assumptions, and even though the journal that published it has distanced itself from it, yet still it is often wheeled out as vindication of the lockdown approach. But like most of the evidence for lockdown, it is entirely based on models, and models are only as good as the assumptions that are put into them. Their hypothetical counterfactual model uses assumptions that were just plain wrong and weren't seen in any country, irrespective of lockdown policy. This paper is typical for literature that supports lockdown, which uses speculation and implausible predictions rather than real-world data and empirical evidence. When examined more closely, the conclusions they arise at are based on questionable modelling, dubious assumptions and unfounded claims. Yet it was used to justify and continue to drive a policy of lockdown which was disproportionate, ineffective and immensely harmful. Lockdown interventions have come at such a high cost, causing immeasurable pain, loss and suffering. It is clear that the damaging consequence of lockdown far outweigh the supposed benefits.